Hello, hello, and welcome back. And before anything else, no, I did not manage to survive a week in the army. Why? Simply put, because simply put, because it hasn't been a week. Funnily enough, I've been released early. Release is that the right word? I don't know. But on the first day there was a Monday. It was like go to there and then be stationed right away, which took a lot faster than it did. But those four days, man, damn, they felt okay. They weren't long, but they definitely felt lonely. Like. I was definitely homesick and I was kind of overreacting kind of bit because like my phone is kind of broken at the moment like the microphone I need an external mic just to make it work so that's kind of cool but I couldn't call my parents which made me really sad for some reason and yeah I'm that emotional so that was that was something but like the minute I've been released and my dad came up and picked me up and we went to to eat somewhere and he like it took 10 minutes to drive back home, so that kind of made me realize, oh yeah, it's not that far from home, I realized, so I am extremely lucky in that aspect. But the thing is, I don't want to talk about the military, I just do not want to think about it. Every time I out, I just want normalcy, because like, in the military, it's definitely not normalcy, I give you that much. Normal, oh, whatever. So that's, that's everything I need to talk about, the army, the like, and yeah, this... This is being recorded in advance, actually. I still want to do it once a week, but like if I have my free time now, I'd rather do that and put it aside, I guess, so I can focus on other stuff, like playing video games, which I have already been doing, so that's really fun. The thing I was missing the most, other than my family and friends in the armor, was definitely video games. Sitting in bed all night wondering what the hell I was doing, that was like a trip all on its own, but like... Came back home, the first thing I did was play video games. And this is what I want to talk about. A game that really made me appreciate storytelling in video game. No, that's a lie, because like... The game that made me appreciate storytelling... Okay, before changing the subject completely, I want to focus on video games. And one game that really made my year last year, and that was a game called Final Fantasy XV. But before talking about Final Fantasy XV, I want to talk about another game, which is Persona 5. Persona 5, while not being a bad game, was really disappointing for me and it only took me like my second playthrough to realize how disappointing it is. I'm not talking about the vanilla version, not the royal version, that was just FYI. So when I got 15, it was honestly such a massive surprise. Like I heard horror stories about 15, but like the day I played it made me realize that most of his horror stories are pretty dumb but like to be fair the game was changed a lot during the time it was released until now i just got into the game last year last year during the summertime actually around this time like july 27 i believe i got three games so that was sekiro fire emblem three houses and final fantasy 15 sekiro because i actually really like problem software video games and fire emblem three houses to seem interesting Fire Emblem, I do want to talk about Fire Emblem Three Houses another time, but like, it's a really good game, by the way, but it made me realize how important trailers can be for a game, like, Fire Emblem Awakening is a really good game for the 3DS, but when Fire Emblem Fates, as massive, controversial as the game can be, especially with its story, I still think it was a better game overall, by either be it by music, characters, or everything else, it's like, a massive step up, but not in the story aspect, far from it. Especially the music, and that trailer that featured the music called A Light, I think they translated into English, by Rei Kondo, honestly made that trailer so much cooler to the point where the localizer realized, yo, let's just take the Japanese turn and just dub it over because it was that cool. And it's like, and the soundtrack for Fire Emblem Free House, uh, Fire Emblem Fates, really good. And then when Fire Emblem Echoes was announced, like the game after that game, a remake of the first game, I believe, seems so boring in comparison, which I initially skipped. I do want to play it one day, no doubt about it, but like the trailer left a lot to be imagined. And But Three Houses managed to get that back with that one trailer. I only saw the trailer after the game came out, once I bought the game, I just heard the game was pretty good and I'm like, I like Fire Emblem Three Houses, I should get this game. The game looks interesting, especially that theme house. Edge of the Dawn, I think it's called, it's pretty good. But then we're watching some of the trailer, the one that features the song, um, Between Heaven and Hell or Heaven and Earth, 
a really good song and I really wish I knew who composed it but like the soundtrack has not been released yet and it annoys me but that's not the point so Fire Emblem Free House is amazing but anyway back to 15 and Persona 5 when I first got my PS4 it was after quite a while my first video game console I got as a kid and that was the Wii and for the longest time it was amazing for me it satisfied every need I had is it either be it action RPG or platforming it just satisfied me to the point where I did I did skip a generation I never bought a PS3 I never bought a Wii U or none of those stuff I did keep up with the handheld I did got a 3DS and I did got a Vita from a friend of mine actually but console wise it just didn't seem interesting for me but then like the new Persona game was announced Persona 5 back where they also printed also announced Persona 4 Dancing All Night and Persona Q. Persona Q, another really good game actually, not gonna lie. Either, either e even though he has his issue. But Persona 5 was definitely the hottest one out there. And the fact that it was really being released for the PS4 and PSD was a pretty cool thing. And I'm like, maybe it's time to get a PS4 because there were so many other games I wanted to get into. And when I mean other games, I just mean Project Diva F, uh, Project Diva Future Tone. And like, yeah, and that's what I got a, and that's why I got a PS4 in the first place. I did got this slim because I'm a cheap ass, not gonna lie. And and I just got that one game until Persona 5 was released, and which did. Oh, I think I got it later on after it's released. I don't really remember. But when I first played through it, I was really happy with it. And then, but during the ending part, I guess to say, after Sheet or during Shido's Palace, it like it felt off and then at the end it was like I just want to finish this game I don't want to look at it last surprise while being a really good song was so repetitive after a while it was not even a joke like the game is around 70 hours and I'm telling you now half of it is just for the intro of last surprise it really got to my nerve to the point where I had to buy the DLC which changes the battle music it is a good song, but I do not think it was a good battle theme, far from it. And it's weird, the soundtrack as a whole felt off to me, I don't know why. Soji Meguru is really pretty good at it. Persona 3 and 4 were had amazing soundtrack, even, even though Mass Destruction and... What was Persona 4 battle theme? Fighting for the Truth, I keep forgetting to be honest, even though I believe Persona 4 has the best soundtrack out of the three games, they never felt repetitive, even though those games took longer, I believe. But Persona 5 soundtrack just felt generic, I couldn't tell why, and it doesn't help that Persona Q soundtrack was very diverse, but then I realized when you have a soundtrack composed by solely by one person, it could really sound meh after a while, I realized. Even though Persona 5 did have three, two different other composers, they were mainly used just for the video game section and cutscene at points, so I never, you, you can never really hear the way, which is kind of dumb. But and for me, Persona 5 was such a disappointment after playing through Final Fantasy 15 because, oh my god, Final Fantasy 15 is an amazing game. Okay, I'll give people benefit of the doubt because every time people mention Final Fantasy 15, the first thing they think of is a long development cycle and it was just a mess when it first came out but then later on got better things to the update and patches. Not, I think that could be an issue why people don't like the game but nowadays though, you buy the game now, like the Royal Edition, really good for the price and really worth the money. And But funny story, the game was first announced back in 2006 and I was only four years old it was like it's such a weird thing looking back in the announcement trailer like wow that game's been in there for a while hasn't it so it was like massive whiplash but like and I and it was it honestly amazes me this is also the first time I was exposed to Yoko Shimura's work and oh my god did she live up to her name I, the only songs I knew from her were from Super Smash Bros, where she did some arrangement. The one I remember first being King's Diddy's theme and the Tetris A theme, I think it's called. And they were really good arrangements. So, But hearing her work in 15, like Somnus, Apocalypse Noctis, oh my god, I got shivers. I still do. And the game's main theme song, uh, Stand By Me by Florence and the Machines, like... Every time the song plays, either be that version or the original or another remix, I will literally start crying. It happened once at the gym and it was really embarrassing trying to explain the person who saw me cry, but that was a day to remember though. So like, 
15 literally made me realize that I hate Persona 5, but like, I don't want to talk about Persona 5, I want to save it for another day, I just want to talk about 15 and why I absolutely love the game, and like, the soundtrack is definitely one of it, and the other one is like, the game as a whole is such a bloody ride that I can never really explain without going into so many tangents and other points. I guess I should start with the main story, and I love this story simply the fact that gods are treated like gods. It's so like in so many other RPGs or JRPGs, I should call them, they always treat gods as someone like, oh, you can just kill and nothing can happen. They're not that big of a deal, but they kind of are, but not that really if you kill them. Like Persona 5, I want to say, but the Persona series as a whole is guilty of it, having like, oh, the god is the final boss, even though it comes out of nowhere. But in 15, they are treated like gods, and that's the main thing I've noticed right away. But another thing I noticed right away was Luna Freya's and Noctis' relationship. When I first played the game, running around through Hammerhead, trying to get my group with the controller, figuring out that, oh, Noctis and Luna Freya only met as children, but then later, but then got separated for 12 years, but then they're getting married, and I'm like, kind of seems off, not gonna lie, because like, there were kids, they're kind of dumb, but then playing through the story, you can actually see that they genuinely love each other. And the thing is, Final Fantasy XV doesn't cram your story into the face. It takes you time with it and it does little details that I absolutely love. The Lover's Notebook is a really good example. When Umbram was first introduced and he hands over the notebook to Noctis, you can see Noctis visibly happy to see Luna Freya is alive and well after the invasion and... What's that town's name again? Um, oh my god, I like I love the game and I cannot remember the, the main city name. Oh my god, the city that was destroyed in the war. No, what's it called? Let me just stop. Insomnia, that's what it is. I completely forgot for a second. Insomnia, when the city was first attacked, Luna Freya managed to escape thanks to the help of Nyx, which I get to later. It made me it made me realize, oh yeah, they actually do because when Luna Freya gets the notebook, she gets visibly happy as well, glad to say the least. And it makes me understand the relationship. And another aspect is that while the relationship is never shown, it's definitely acted upon. Like you can tell by their action that they genuinely love each other. And another fact about the lover's notebook, if you choose the really good options when you're when Noctis write down on something on it. Once you get it after the invasion in Altesia, it, the description reads as though something along the line, the last page is stained by tears. When I first noticed that in my second playthrough, I started crying because like, oh my god, that was literally the last thing Luna Freya saw before she died. And like, all the spoilers, I'm talking this game dry. And then, and the way Act Noctis acts during her after her death really show how important she was for her for him what her what she meant to him and that's something i can appreciate the same thing with luna freya she does a lot of stuff in the story that no one gives credit to people's hajime tapara i think is the one that mentioned that she's a strong character but a lot of people seem to disagree with him even though it makes perfect sense luna freya isn't strong as in mean like i can kill anyone who comes in my way but strong in a sort of, in her own will, what she thinks is right. Like, she communicates with the gods, which is no easy feat for a human because it physically aids her, like it physically kills her. But she does it only, only so she can be with Noctis. Even though at the end she realized she's dying, the only thing she wanted to do was protect Noctis, make sure she gives the ring to him, making sure that she, he can save the world from the scars, the... Star Scourge, I think it's called, but I can never pronounce it right. Scar or Star. Anyway, and, it, and, it, and the way Noctis acts during, after her death, especially compared to the crew of the game, it's like heart wrenching. Even though after her death, she's still shown off. Like, she, there's some cutscenes with her later on, which I think were added after an update. Like, this little kid comes in Tenebrae acting Noctis. Did you really love Lula Freya? It's like kind of a dick move for a kid, but like still. And then you show the cutscene with her and Jake and Tiana talking about the wedding dress that all she wants is just to be with Noctis. That really got to me and you can tell that she genuinely loves him. And Noctis as well. Her death impacted him so much to the point that it almost ruined his main friendship to the guys. And it's like, 
heartbreaking and that ending scene in the afterlife where they're together floored me to say the least it got to me even though the last line with the gang oh god like everything in the game made me cry and the only thing and it's after my friend started playing danganronpa v3 i realized why v15 story got to me it's that after playing okay not playing for v3 but reading the story of v3 because it was first released in japan and i really wanted to know what happened the main message of the final trial, I'm not gonna spoil all of V3, but the main message of the final trial, skip 10 minutes, 10 seconds actually if you don't want to hear it, is that even if it's fictional, it's still real for us, like the emotion we feel from it, it's still emotion we feel. And that really got to me, it made me embrace that literature in any media, even if it be by movie, book, anime, manga, or video games, or TV show, they can make you cry, they can make you happy, and it makes me really appreciate storytelling in video games much more, which is, and 15 really just got to me as a whole. Another aspect of 15 I absolutely love is the main Kang, not just Prompto, Ignis, and Gladius, they're all really good, especially Gladius, and I'm not talking about looks as well. I was so ready for Gladius just to be this beef guy that doesn't talk much, being a rude ass dick. Also having this fake deep voice, but like, oh, I'm just a dude with the guns for hands and like, but seeing his character actually being a character really surprised me and it's like, he's a good character, especially his voice actor. I forget his name, but he does a good job making a man voice sound like a man. The acting in general, the English dub I mean, is really good and at points I actually prefer it over the Japanese version. I'm not someone who prefers one over the other. But for 15 it's definitely a case because in the Japanese version, one aspect I did not like and that's towards Luna, Luna Freya's character is that she uses honorifics for pretty much for everyone really and it's annoying because like even during her last scene with Noctis, the one where, he, where she says farewell, in the end she still mentions Noctis as Noctisama which means a really big rank in Japan or something and it made me like oh she, she only he only looks she only looks at him like as though he's someone more than her not someone she can actually love and be with or like but in but in the english version it was simply put farewell noctis which is so much better but the thing is honorific doesn't really translate it well to english so that's why they scrapped it up the way they make her seem higher up and more elegant is giving her a british accent which kind of makes me laugh but it fits her so i'm okay with and like overall the English stuff sounds better but even though there's like some complaint during the ending scene where Noctis says you guys are the best really made me sad as well it made me flourish even more like I beat the game a second time and made me cry so much it was during the night so I could not cry a lot without waking up my family or something so I had to sit in my room in the chair with tears rolling down my mouth and gasping for her like <laughs> it was like it was it was a sight to be whole but in the, in the Japanese version, he used Daisuki, which means I like you guys or something along those lines. But for some, pe for some people, they translated that I love you, even though Daisuki is never used to say I love you in Japanese, it's only used for I like you. It would have been much more impactful if he said Aishideru, but that's usually made, made for couples with boyfriend and girlfriend. And like, you guys are the best, really sums up what Noctis feels with his friends and like, honestly. And the way everyone reacts, honestly, and it's not even the character, the main characters, the side characters get really good development to my surprise. Like Taka from Hammerhead does a pretty good job, Sid and Sydney are pretty good characters. Like, and Helen from Lestalem, I think her name, she actually is an interesting character. And I'm like, she doesn't even get a unique design. I'm pretty sure it's a basic NBC. Yes, she's interesting. Also, the name I can never pronounce, Kurtana, Kurtana from Golden Key also got to me and Dino was also such a fun character just to talk to. Honestly, everything about the game feels alive and that what got to me the most, like traveling around EOS was definitely the best shit ever, even though it was mainly in the car because the game really made me scared to go out in the wildness because of how intense it can be. Like, no joke, when they, when they mention that demons come out at night, I made sure never to go out at night. And like, driving in video game, I never done it, up until the point the game forced you to do it with Arden. Arden being a really good character all on its own. 
But like this cut it shortly, I just love the story of 15 so much more because it isn't a cliche fest, it does something new. Persona 5, like this only game I compare it to because it was thanks to Final Fantasy 15, I realized why I do not like Persona 5. Persona 5 scares it does something new with its story and choose to play it safe. I guess it's because it's been in development for such a long time that the developers realized we don't want to make a controversial story that people drop out of the game or people don't want to recommend the game so we play it safe and pretty much rehash the story from Persona 4 and I understand and the characters are so utterly bland in my opinion like the politician was more interesting than half the main cast like how do you do that that's honestly the most impressive shit out there it didn't it didn't take until the Persona 5 dancing all all night what's it called Persona 5 dancing in Starlight to actually make me like the main cast is like and I don't even like Persona 5's Dancing in Starlight I think that was a really bad rhythm game but that's not not, not discussion for today but it was thanks to that game that actually made me like the Phantom Thief but in the original Persona version that made me uh, the only ones that were good was Futaba, Ryuji and that's pretty much it every other one just felt bland like Makoto especially damn girl you could have be handled so much better but you weren't but with 15, they made sure that each character, either have it be a big role or a small role, can still be pretty interesting. It's not as it's not like as though the game is perfect with the story. The way they handle war and war in general, the subject is very under shown and it's really poorly interpreted, even in the movie Kingslave. And I don't even like Kingslave because Kingslave is what I I mean Kingslave story I mean is why I don't like it it's like Final Fantasy XV tries something new yet Kingslave does something generic I guess even Luna Freya's character felt so bland compared to her video game counterpart Nyx it's he's such a generic protagonist that he's so bland not even his design oh and I got a notification whoops I am a professional like his character is so generic his design as well the only interesting character was crow and she dies in the first 20 minutes like oh she's pretty cool oh she's dead that kind of sucked and liberus i his name i think is pronounced i can never pronounce his name while being okay his character felt so uh okay he's there he drove around a bit cool and luna for his character she honestly felt like a bag being thrown around all the time he doesn't help that her dress feels like a plastic bag I watched the movie like two times. The first time after the invasion in Insomnia, after I got really into the game and I'm like, oh crap, I should probably see the movie before doing anything else, which that's what I did. And, and then the second time with my sister, I was planning on actually doing another separate video about the, about the movie actually. And I even wrote something down like when I was watching the movie and I thought I could list them out here because like, it pretty much captures why I don't like the movie, especially compared to the game. It's the same thing with the light novel, the one that came that came out recently. Actually, I do want to read it. I do want to buy it just to have it. But I am not excited for it. But I'm going to talk about it later. I'm going to focus on the movie. So give me a sec. Like, there's so many plot points in the movie that I feel like they don't really do much about it. Like, there was a, something about immigration or something, but the, the movie never really talks about it. Like, oh, Nyx is from another town that's being sold into Niflheim. So, like, so does that something come out of it? It was one of the reasons why Kingslave, the group I used to call them, got disbanded, like, they betrayed the king or something. It's all. But it never really talks out, and Libertus has a drug plot problem or something. Like he takes some pills, it makes like a big emphasis about it, but then it never talks about a game again. And like Nyx has a weird dream with his little sister, which I think died or something. That's what it was implied. And like Luna Freya character felt like a plastic bag, and she wears like a plastic trash. She wears a plastic trash, not gonna lie, that's what it looks like. And the movie, I'm pretty sure there's a car commercial somewhere, also a phone, but I do not know much about cars, nor phones, so I really can't tell. Also, the game, this movie, I should say, makes you feel bad for Crow's death, but like, she's never been developed. Well, she is an interesting character, she just dies. 
Also, the also the movie is like, oh, let's give him a flat, let's give a flashback because like, oh, they don't remember what happened half an hour ago. Let's just show it again, which is dumb. Also, Arden has this weird crab thing, which is is in original, in some original artwork, but I've never seen him wear the game except for some point. I don't even understand what it is. Is it a shell? I don't know. There was also a resistance or something like groups going against the king's order about them selling off. Not selling off, giving away half the land just to protect the ground city and give the uh, around the towns away or something. The only good thing I like about the movie was definitely King Regis. He was such a good character, even though the game does a pretty okay job with portraying portraying him. He was still pretty good, even though his friends kind of suck because they all die trying to protect him. But during that scene with like talk about the punishment with someone invading or something it's been a while and the robots just coming down from breaking the glass were such an honest to god really good scene transition like the, the cinematography even though this is a cg movie the way the camera placement was a pretty good thing about it but like after a while it just got boring and king we just die that sucked also i watched it with my sister and she and the minute they showed about the king the table around all the all past kings looking around Nyx, I think it was. And my sister's like, oh, hey, like the Indiana Jones movie. And I can never not look the way it's supposed to look. So that kind of sucks. Again, the movie does look pretty for a CG movie. I give it that much also. But the main antagonist, the captain, I think it was, is like, okay. So it kind of makes no sense. But like, okay. But another thing I liked about the movie, the only w another one thing I liked, was definitely the post credit scene where they show the main cast getting stranded. That was just such a cute and funny ending to it, even though the movie ends on a clip hung. It's like, it's not as bad as people make it out to be. Apparently it had a lot of negative reviews when it first came out. On its own, it's generally an okay movie. You can close your mind for it and still have a good time with the pretty visuals. But compared to the game, really just made me don't care about it, just seems so generic by it. The same thing with the light novel, The Dawn of the Future, I think it's called. It's supposed to be what the canceled DLCs were supposed to tell or something like it, the alternate story. But the alternate story was another cliche story. Let's go to fight gods. Like Bahamut and uh, Preparation. Oh God, English is hard, people. Uh, inv not an invasion, Jesus says. Let me think about this. Portrayal in the game was pretty good. He's seen as an omnipotent god, which he is, but he still has his limitation. And he had to take drastic measures to make sure the demon scourge doesn't go all haywire and kill all humans. So he had to make such big things, even though it means sacrificing one human and another human just to make it work, which is definitely a hard thing to do. But in episode Arden, the last DLC, I do like a DLC, but his portrayal was absolute shit. He seems to do it because he's bored and it's like, I, that, that was never the interpretation I got. And the light novel just makes him even worse being another, oh, he's a dumb god, let's go against God. And then they go kill God and then everyone dies. Like, oh, Lunafer is not dead. Bahamut just bang her back to life, which is something he's never shown to do. So it's like... Uh, but I still want to read the light novel, not gonna lie, I just read like a synopsis summary of it on the Wikipedia, so I might be wrong in it, but so far it's not really holding my attention, being another, you know, cliche story. But let's go back to the game, and I just love the game, it's such a good game, can I, have I not mentioned how good it is? Like every time I want to replay the game from the start because I don't like doing New Game Plus because you're just so over level, especially the Ring of Lucy or Lucia, I think it's pronounced. I can, the English lexicon is so confusing that I need to hear like five times just to get it right. It's such an OP weapon, but that's the point. But like, it doesn't make a fun New Game Plus to say the least. But every time I do it and then they show the scene of them pushing the car and then stand by me, play, I just shed tears because it's such a good thing and knowing what happens to them just gets to me. One complaint I hear this people talk about is that later on it feels much more linear and like yeah but that was the point because like you're run you're running out of time, there's not much time to go around, you need to do this and it's like okay and it makes sense. Like 
And it doesn't help that I think later on in the update patches, the whole Niflheim area, the in the military base, I think it was like going around there was actually changed. I think, but I never played there when it first came out, and I just know it from there, from the new updated version. And I did not thought it was that bad. It was actually really scary shitless, but like being bad or frustrating was never the case. Another thing I like about the music, another thing I like about the game is certainly the music and. Honestly, the music is such so good. Like Yoko Shimomura does an amazing job, and like, and I believe the developers knew that having one composer isn't enough. Actually, so they brought in two other people, Yoshin Yoshino Aoki, I think Yoshino Yaoki, and another one called another one. Um, let me just get his name right because I want to get it right. And I, I hate being wrong. There's a reason why I give credit to each song I put in because I just want to be right. Uh, yeah, the other one being Tetsuya Shipada. They all do a really good job. I know, like, the music is so good. And the thing is, having one composer for a really long game can be really bad thing. Like, Persona 5 and the original Kingdom Hearts can, can be a really good example because at one point the music just becomes repetitive. You understand the composer's style. So, like, what more can you do? And Kingdom Hearts later on realizes this, so during Birth by Sleep or and Dream Drop Distance, they bring out two other composers, and I think it does this soundtrack pretty good. Makes them stand out about the rest, but Persona 5, Noah Shema Sh Sh Shoki, I just say his name just in the beginning, Sh Shoki Makuru, Soji Makuru, he's a really good composer, and Persona 3 and 4 are phenomenal soundtrack, and they work during the time, but Persona 5 was just so long and the music just became bland after a while. But 15 managed to get away with it, having three composers doing a lot of amazing works. Definitely some of my favorite tracks. Also, I, I know most of the track on top of my head to the point during a party. We were playing a game, if you can figure out the soundtrack. Don't ask me what kind of party I was at, it was a weird night. And I'm like, yo, if you can, if you show me like five second clip of the song, I can tell you the name right away. And I did it for pretty much all of them. Sobness being the main theme is a phenomenal thing, but I do theme. But I do prefer the instrumental version compared to the vocals one. On Andrea Hopkins has amazing vocals, not gonna lie, but the way Kwa it says in the song sounds really stupid, not gonna lie. But other than that, the soundtrack, actually, I don't know the sound, there is vocal themes, I know the Song of the Star has vocals in it, I don't know who, whose it is, but they're pretty good, they're pretty high. But for the, for the most part, there's barely any lyrics to the song, which is okay. And the fact that the soundtrack is quite dynamic, not in a sort of near Automata's kind of dynamic, like when you go to an area that completely changes. Like 15 has like, like Hammerhead when you're in the outside, it plays a nice guitar version, but when you go in, there's a little more rock and bass, rock and bass to it. The same thing with Golden Key in the port area. It's such a nice relaxing song. Going in the restaurant, it's such a Ram Param song the same with Lestal, I'm outside okay, but going deeper is such a massive punch. And when you stay in the hotel, there's another interpretation of the song. But songs like Apocalypse Noctis and Apocalypse Aquarius, they're quite dynamic to the point where it just it fits so well. And the same thing with Hellfire, an amazing song, mind you. It's the way it cuts in and then changes to an uh like Heroic and then goes back down to being intense, but during the end showing the Shiva's and Ifrit's relationship, it really shined and it was amazing. I, I, same with Ma Magna Insomnia, that ending part with Noctis and Ar Arden simply almost to the verge of death and fighting just one last time and the vocal going all out was so amazing. And it was good. Oh, and, and the Hydrian's Wrath, the way it starts is like, like with this nice drum beat, I can say, and the and the Leviathan going around really fit the song song somehow. And it's, and it's cool. Another and the DLC soundtracks are even better because instead of having Yoko Shimomura doing it, they gave it to other composer. Like one, it was one DLC for each characters, and one and each of them got one main composer like for episode gladios while not being the best dlc it's still pretty good and i like the way gladios was in it it was done by keiji okabe which he did two thongs like two thongs 
two songs, Shield of the King and Battle on the Main on the Big Bridge. Amazing song. I like singing on it. And of course, Yoshino Aoki and Tatsuya Tatsuya Shibata. Yeah, I want to get it right. Also did a little bit like Spirits Converge and the Trials of the Shields are an amazing song. And the second DLC had so many other songs and they're all done by Naoshi Mizuta. Honestly, that one part in Home Sweet Home, honestly, really just makes me cry. A lot of this game makes me cry, like the fucking car, the regalia, cried. I don't know why, when they show this scene with Noctis saying goodbye to the car with his pair, with his father, honestly got to me. Anyway, back to the DLC, and the third DLC actually, it's actually the multiplayer expanded combat, which I never really got into, I'm not a really big multiplayer game fan at all. So it's like, I never really got into it, I tried it a little bit, but there's a lot that goes into it. But the theme song, Choosing Hope by the series main composer, Nobu Uematsu, is pretty good, especially the vocals of Emiko Suzuki, they were pretty good. But other than that, there really isn't any other songs I can actually think of it. I think Clash of the Sword is good, but like, eh. And the fourth DLC is done by one of my favorite composers, actually. Um, they I can never pronounce his name though, Teto Yoshi Makino is pretty fucking good. And with the arrangement of... And the arrangement by Yoshinori Mitsuda honestly made it amazing. Like, he was the guest composer, but he did a pretty good job. And the Royal Edition of the sound of the game had a lot of other tracks, like two especially that really made me go crazy. It was definitely Advent of the Apocalypse that one song in German and the Moonlit Melodies are honestly a phenomenal track and like the soundtrack as a whole as a whole as a whole is so diverse one one minute you listen to this operonic operonic bombastic song and then you hear such nice strings like Vals de Fantastica Crystalline Chill as the name implies is such a chill song and Real rumble made fishing so much fun. Fishing in general in 15 made me realize how fun fishing minigames can be in a video game. It was like, every game needs a fishing minigame or a camera mode. It just needs to be there and there's no arguments in it. Fight me on this. I'm not saying the game is perfect, far from it. Like, while I do praise the story a lot, there are some aspects of it I just simply don't like. Like, war, per the way they treat poor, they portray war, while it was never the highlight, it just like brushed aside and like... War is a big deal, guys. It can really tear people apart. Even after Noxious finds out his father is dead, he gets his angry moment, gets his revenge on later on. like, I'm chill about it. And if, I'm pretty sure Iris and Gladiola's fathers die. It was in the movie, but then the game like, yeah, we forget about them. But for the most part, I think the story is still strong and the fact that it's not another cliche, let's go against faith sort of prep, but actually accepting faith being a part of life was honestly such a fresh breath of air that I've never thought I could see, that I could hear, especially after Persona 5. I'm never gonna let go that Persona 5 was disappointed with me. I had bought Persona 5 Royal recently, like for my birthday. But I don't have the chance to play it with my whole army service. I do have a chance now, but I'd rather play 15, not gonna lie. And another aspect I really liked 15 was definitely the main band turn. Like, when you go to campsite, they talk for a bit. When you walk around, they talk a bit like, Oh, it's getting late. Let's go to bed. And then you keep going around getting tired. I just love it. Like. I'm, an, I'm a person that believes like when you go for realism a game you can actually quite hurt the game in the long run like after a while with better hardware and limitation it's just gonna look plain but like but when you have an art style like Catherine or hell even Persona 5 which is one thing Persona 5 does really well is the art style it can make the game look ages like Okami as well but, but 15 really just takes that expectation of me and kills it because the amount of details on the characters' expression on their faces, while they do have their goofy moment, but for the most part they're really solid. It makes me question like, oh yeah, sometimes they can just simply work when you do realism. And it's like, it's good. It made me happy. 
it not made me happy, it made me appreciate the finer detail, especially like the fact that if you walk around like in the the hot sun, underneath the hot sun, the characters actually do sweat, like the clothes becomes a little bit blackish, more like wet blackish, like oh this is the details I love, especially with Gladio, I'm not gonna lie, he's my favorite if you don't know. As a whole, 15 made me revamp video games in general. It wasn't like I was lacking into anything of it. Actually, I did the first word in Fire Emblem Three Houses before I even beat Final Fantasy 15. But it made me appreciate storytelling in video games so much more. Like, and it made me realize that every year there's just one game that just makes me makes the entire year for me. Like for this year. Even though like half of it is being taken away from me, it was definitely Kingdom Hearts 3, which I'll get to later when I talk about Kingdom Hearts. But last year was definitely 15, and the year before that was... Oh, that again, I keep forgetting. I have a list somewhere I actually wrote them down, but I don't remember. But the game that made me realize that it just video games are just more than just mindless entertainment was definitely Kirby Triple Deluxe for the 3DS. Such a weird game compared to Final Fantasy, Final Fantasy 15, but like... It made me appreciate a lot of aspects, and the main aspect was music. During that time, music was never a really big deal for me. Like, even when growing up, music was just, no, it's okay thing. I listen to it when I want to, but for the most part, I don't listen to it. But Kirby Triple Deluxe made me love video game music. Music as a whole gave me a good, a really good uh, appreciation for it. Hirokazu Ondo and Jinikawa. I'm just gonna Google it real quick just to have it right because I don't want to be wrong. I want to be right. Yeah, yeah, there you go. Jun Ishikawa and Hirokazu Ando made a phenomenal job on Triple Deluxe soundtrack. They're all. It they made me realize how catchy it is and how more it can be. Like the final boss theme. Um, let me just get the name right because it's been a while. Because also the English name is actually different. So it's Fatal Blooms in Moonlight made me love music as a whole. It gave me a whole, whole, a whole new appreciation for it. And a special track exclusive for the soundtrack, Midnight Moonlight Forever Sleeping Flower, like a new arrangement for it, just made me open my eyes to all sorts of music. And then I got into Persona, which has amazing music on its own. And then so many other games, but like how much do I like Kirby Triple Deluxe? To the point where I actually 100% of the game nine nine different times. Like, I love that game that much. And it's such a shame that Kirby Planet Robobot did not capture me. It's not a bad game, far from it. But like, there's something Kirby Triple Deluxe that just get to me. And to the and if it's not for that soundtrack, I would have not that bit into video games at all. But that's all I have to say for this week, podcast. Even though, like, I've only been to the army for like four days, I am gonna release it on a Monday just to have a good track record and just to do it like that. Just to pre record it, have it ready for. So when I do go for a long day, that I don't have something to be. something to. Oh crap, it's. I haven't uploaded in a while. That sucks. Anyway, thank you for listening and I hope I can see you again next week. Where we talk about more stuff because I'm pretty sure I talked, I want to talk about video game music as a whole, and then I ended up talking about Final Fantasy 15. But, like, hey, yo. And don't worry, this will not be the last time I talk about Final Fantasy 15. I want to talk more of it. But, hey, yo. And my hatred for Persona 5, but that's, uh, that's going to be another one. Thanks again.